way, if you're watching from home, just know that I'm drawing on the whiteboard so you don't get to see. Sorry? And then the third one is the methods. That's the way it's divvied up. You know, and I probably could switch over to, uh, you know, typing this in a notepad or whatever. So we're going to have a dog. What kind of data might a dog have? Well, he might have the amount of food in his belly, right, whether he's fed or not. You know, so he's going to have a food, and we're just going to store that as an end. Where each time he eats, it's going to increase his food by one. So he's going to have a method, a behavior called eat. And he's going to have another one called run. Every time he eats, it's going to add one to food. Every time he runs, it's going to subtract one from food. All right, but that's too easy. We could get that done in 10 minutes. So what we're going to do is we're going to define that the dog has some other things. The dog not only has a food value, he's got a mouth that lets him eat. So he's going to have a mouth object. And then he's got legs or feet that let him run. So we're going to need to define two more classes, one called mouth and one called legs. So I'm going to have a second class called mouth. I may not even put any data in it. So. I mean, yeah, if I wanted to go nuts, I could. He's going to have a couple of behaviors, a couple of methods. He can open his mouth, he can swallow, and he can close his mouth. For running, his legs are going to move. So we're going to have one more class called leg. He's actually going to probably need four legs. I'm going to ignore that and just pretend that we have one class called legs rather than implement four different legs, you know, a leg object and creating four different legs. No, 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 why don't we go whole hog? We're going to have an object called legs, and so we're going to have L1, L2, L3, and L4, and they're all legs. And so the mouth is going to be of type mouth. This is going to be lowercase, this is going to be uppercase, because that's how we distinguish between classes and variables. This should be a lowercase i. I'm not going to take too much time to fix all that. I know you can't read. It's L1, L2, L3, L4, but that's what I said. All right, and all the leg is going to do is have a method called run. So to make things simple, what we're going to do is the leg class, when you call run, all it's going to do is print run, right? The mouth class, when you call open, all it's going to do is say mouth open. And then when you call swallow, you're, it's going to print, you know, mouth swallowing. And then when you call close, it's going to print mouth closing. The dog class, you know, when it calls eat, what is it going to do? It's going to do four different things. And that's about the time when I probably ought to do it on my That's the UML for our mouth class. You don't have to type this in. Now we're going to make another UML for the leg class. You know, and the mouth class could have a state indicating whether his mouth was open already, so that if you told him to open his mouth and his mouth is already open, you know. But we're not going to bother. I'm not going to make this too complex. And the leg class just had one method, run. 
Now notice what I'm doing here is I'm putting the name of the method and then I'm following it by the type, the colon and the type. And that's just, that's, I didn't make that up and it's kind of weird because in our language we put the type on this side, right? Rather than on the other side. We just have to kind of get used to that. And I'm going to go ahead and put parentheses here to indicate that these are functions, that these are methods, but they do not take any arguments. Okay, so that's my mouth class. In a UML diagram, that's the class name. Those are the variables. Those are the methods. In this uh, So that's my first UML. And then the UML for the leg class, I don't know why this says mouth close, or leg class, got to fix that. And this should be capitalized. All your classes should be capitalized just by convention, but everybody does it. Okay. And then we're going to do the dog. This is called composition. One class is composed of other classes. And is the book ready to talk about this yet? No, but we are, because we are awesome. So here's the UML for the dog class. Class name is dog. He's got a state variable, state meaning, you know, what state he's currently in, his data, and we said that was his food in his belly, which I'm just going to represent by an int. But he's also got a mouth, and he's also got four legs. Leg one is a leg. I guess I'm just going to call his mouth lowercase m, but the class is going to be uppercase m. So leg one, and then leg two, and then leg three, and leg four. He's going to have four legs. I could have listed them all on one line, right? Leg one, comma, leg two, comma, leg three, comma, leg four. All right, so those are our UML diagrams. Let's talk about what each one is going to do we would need to list what these methods are going to do. Open, prints, my mouth is open. Swallow, prints, I am swallowing. Close, prints, you know, my mouth is closed. All right, in his leg. What does run do? Run, prints, my leg is running. And then down here, we haven't listed his, I've forgotten what I said he was going to do. Eat and run. So he needs one more little block, his block of methods. So eat returns nothing, and then run returns nothing. The word void just means that it doesn't return anything. It doesn't need to return an integer or a string or anything because when we call it, we just want it to trigger an event, not perform a calculation. So a void method probably does not perform a calculation because it's not going to return anything. I guess you could make it to where run returns false if he didn't have any food in his stomach, right? Or eat return false if he had eaten too much, right? You know, we could go nuts coming up with examples like that. Okay, so what are the uh, eat method going to do? The eat, what's it going to do? It's going to make the mouth open, mouth swallow, mouth close, and then increment the food. That's what the eat method needs to do. The run method needs to make leg one run, leg two run, leg three run, like four run, and then it's going to subtract one from the food. So we have a complete spec here. We can go and implement these three classes. 
I think we ought to go ahead and do so. And maybe we'll even be awesome enough to put these in separate files, separate .java files rather than just one. This making sense so far? I didn't stop to ask. Yes, sir. Yeah, what lecture is this? Since Good question. What lecture is this? Didn't we skip one accidentally M2. last time? This is M2. We skipped L last time. <laughs> M2, oh well, we're just going to go to N then. All right, L is the great mystery one. It's like Amelia Earhart. Nobody knows what happened to L. So. She showed up on Star Trek. That's right, that's right. Maybe that Miss Lecture will. <laughs> All right, so lecture N. But you get the idea of the attributes versus the behaviors. The data is stuff that describes the state of the object. In this case, we only have one state being maintained anywhere in this, which is the object, the dog's hunger. We could have a lot of states if we wanted to. We could have a state for whether his mouth is open or closed, like I said, or whether he was full, you know, or what his max capacity was, or if we cared a lot about other pieces of information, like his size, how heavy he is, when is he, you know, when did he last have his shots. All of that could be state information, the things that describe the dog. Okay, now when I tell you to create a class, don't start adding things to your main method. If you're making a class, you're making a brand new class. So, that's exactly what we're going to do. Over here, in Navigator, nope, over here in Projects, find your project folder, and we're going to create a brand new class. Select the package, or if we remove the package, you know, great. Maybe I will remove the package. Doesn't really matter. I'm going to go ahead and do that, though. Move class to correct folder. Doesn't matter. But in, go ahead and choose projects from this stuff down the side. I'm going to undo that. I'm going to leave it all alone. So projects, right click on that package and do new Java class and call it mouth. Let's implement the mouth class first. So the class name is going to be mouth. The package is just going to be in whatever original package, but if you deleted the package, you're going to want to delete that, right? I chose not to delete my package, so I'm going to leave it in its package. All righty. So I don't have any data. So for now, I'm just going to put no member variables. But I did have some methods. Anybody remember any of the methods that I was going to add to the mouth class? Open. Open and then close and then swallow. And if I recall, I said that they're all going to be of type void. So they don't need to return anything. These are all what are known as instance methods meaning that we're going to have to have a mouth before we can open it and close it, so we will not define it as static. Now I'm going to use a keyword that we have not been using before, which is public. Public means that anybody can call that method. If I declared it as private, only other methods in that class could call that method. In general, you're going to make your methods public as a matter of course, unless you come up with a really good reason not to. If you... Yes, sir. Okay, sorry. No problem. I just want to make sure, we deleted the package by lecturing, this is still work, right? Right. Okay, um, okay. If you delete the package, then when you add a new class... I just want to, I just want to do the default. Right. Added. When you add a new class to it, then uh, back that out. Oh, okay. Or delete the word package you know, from every one of your files so that they're all in the same folder. It's all cool. Yeah, I went under default too, like you did. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. So, if you do not put the keyword public or private there, it assumes a default. And that default is, is that anything in the package can call that method, but anything outside the package cannot. 
Now, for you guys who put it in a default, then there's no such limit, right? You know, but anyways, just, just go with public unless you can come up with a real good reason otherwise. All right, so public void open. Parentheses in parentheses. These are just like function declarations you've seen before in other languages. And I'm going to print my mouth is open or opening mouth, something like that. System.out.println opening mouth. Add one to close. I mean, you know, copy, paste that, and make one for close. And copy and paste it and make one for swallowing. instead of saying swallowing mouth, I'm going to put mouth is swallowing. Wait a minute. I already put swallowing mouth up here. That's wrong. It's supposed to be closing mouth. I was thinking ahead. All right. Now what I want to avoid is making us write 20 classes before we can ever even run the program. What you want to do is incremental development. So we probably want to write a little test application, which is known as a driver. Well, the driver is the code that uses the classes. That's a generic term. The driver exercises the classes. And it's not just for test purposes, but this one is going to be for test purposes. So we're going to go back to main, and we're going to create a mouth. And we're going to call mouth.open, mouth.swallow, and mouth.close. And we're just going to check to see that we get all the messages on the screen. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. What's that? All right, now we're not supposed to put any of this stuff inside main. We have a main method and we don't want a main method. So delete the main method. Not, not all, don't, don't delete everything, just delete the definition of the main method. Mm. Comment it out, that's good too. Yeah, okay. That'll fix those syntax errors. Whoops. Oh, I see what you're doing. Yeah. So everybody has a mouth file, mouth.java. One thing to note is that the file name has to match the name of the class. Now, on uh, Tuesday, I stuck multiple classes in one file. That's a terribly tacky thing to do, so that's why I didn't do it this time. If you do stick multiple classes in one file, only one of the classes can be public, and that's the one that has to match the name. But if you put one class per file, then the generic uh, term is that the class name has to match the file name. All right. So, too, were you able to get this part of the code in? All right, so we're going to create a leg class. No, wait, wait, I lied. Remember I said we were going to test this class. First thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to build it and make sure I don't have any errors. The code's not going to do anything at all, right? Because although I have some code here, I don't have anything that runs that code. So nothing's going to happen. But as long as I don't get any syntax errors, I'm happy. If you have syntax errors at this point, you better wave your hand and we can fix it before we go on. 
All right, so now I want to test this class. So I'm going to go back to my main method in my original Java file. And I tend to call this the main class, even though that's not its name, right? But it's the main class because it's got the... And I'm going to put this as the driver for the mouth class. For now, eventually we're going to probably delete this code, or at least comment it out. So let's make a new mouth. Mouth M equals new mouth. And let's test it out. M dot open. M dot swallow. M dot close. mouth, mouth is swallow, and closing mouth. So that little class did what it's supposed to do. I could keep this code for test purposes. What would be really neat is if I created a test suite. So I could do what's known as unit testing. But we're not going to do that for now. Once I run it and it works, I think I'm just going to comment it out for now. Let's go to the leg class. The leg class is simpler. It's only got one method. But we've got to make a new one, right? So oh, projects. Yes, sir. My mouth didn't work. Okay, let me come look. I hate when my mouth. Alrighty, so I need to make a new class. It needs to be in the same folder as the other things. So since I still have a package, I'm going to make mine there. New Java class, and this is a leg. And it did not have any data, but it does have at least one method, which was called run, I think, or move. Right, okay. So void run parentheses in parentheses, open curly brace, and then print this leg is running. By the way, I have a file to give y'all Java coding standards. Some of the other profs use it and make their students comment the code exactly to coding standards. I'm going to give you the file. Not really hold you to it, but I want you to look it over and understand that if you would taken a class from another professor, that uh, you would be held to those standards. All righty, so that's my leg class. Go and create a driver in your main method in your main class that exercises the leg. Just make one leg and then call run on it. And I want you to do that by yourself, although of course I'll show you the answer. I'm just Okay, so now that I have a leg, I'm going to go back to our main method, our driver. This is the driver of the leg class. I don't care if you put that comment. Leg L is equal to new leg. And L dot run. Now when it runs, it ought to say that the leg is running. And if I uncommented the other stuff, it'd be talking about the mouth as well, right? Opening and closing the mouth. All right. We almost have everything we need. We need to make the dog. Now the dog is the most complex class because it actually had data. It's only got one piece of data, but it has data and has more methods than the other one. Well, it's only got two methods, but it's got like six data. And the methods are a little bit more complicated because they do more than just call print. So go and make a dog class. 
same folder. New Java class dog. Now he had an integer that represented his food in his belly. So int food. It's going to start off as zero for things hungry. And then he had some, he had a mouth. Now I'm going to do that little thing where you differentiate between the class and the object just by uppercase and lowercase. And I'm not totally fond of doing that in a, in a class because, I mean, not a class, in a, as a demonstration because people start mixing up the uppercase and lowercase. Just be real careful that your variables are called lowercase. So mouth, lowercase mouth, equals new mouth with an uppercase, like that. So the variable name, the part in green is lowercase, and the parts in black are uppercase. And I'm going to be making four legs in the same way. So, capital L, leg, lowercase l, leg one, equals new, capital L, leg. Not new, leg one. Leg is the name of our class. And so we call new leg to create a leg. We just give it a new name. And then copy and paste that and make leg two, leg three, and leg four. We could even create an array of legs if we've talked about arrays yet. Leg two. Leg three. Leg four. So those are his variables, his instance variables, because they're non-static. And your general rule of thumb should be to make your data, your variables private, and your methods public. We should make all these private. Yeah, I'm going to leave that alone for now to avoid cluttering this stuff up too much, but I am going to make the methods public. And by the way, I think I forgot to make the run method public. It'll still work because we're all in the same package. But while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to go back to leg and make the run method public. Just because of my rule of thumb. Make your methods public, make your data elements private. We'll talk about why you do that later. All right, now our methods. These are instance methods because they're non-static. I think we only had two of them. I think we had one called eat and one called run. I'm going to confirm that. Yep, eat and run. Sounds like a restaurant. Okay. So public void eat. And I'm not going to put any data in it yet. Public void run. I'm not going to put any data in it. And this is still inside the dog class. Now that I have my kind of little framework here, my little skeleton, right? I'm going to actually make it do the work that it's supposed to do. The run, excuse me, the eat is supposed to do this stuff. Mouth open, mouth swallow, mouth close, and then add one to food. All right. So, this dot, mouth dot, open. You can leave off the this keyword. That just specifies that that variable is a part of the class that we are currently looking at. To me, it makes it easier to type, right? I type this dot m, and it jumps to mouth. And then this dot, mouth dot swallow. And this dot, mouth dot close. It makes sense if close happens before swallow. Yeah. And then we're going to add one to his food. This dot food dot plus plus. Wait, no, I'm not dot. Just this dot food plus plus. Add one to his food.
Now I want you all to do the same thing for the run method. Here's what the run is supposed to do. It's supposed to run, well, I guess that would help, but you know, it's supposed to call the dot run method on leg one, leg two, leg three, and leg four. So, this dot leg one dot run, this dot leg two dot run, this is about the time where I would start copying and pasting. Leg three and leg four. dot food minus minus and like I said in most cases the this keyword is optional I could go and delete them all if you think it's extra typing and you didn't want to do it then then you don't have to but I sure do find it nice to be able to type this dot and then get a list of all the variables that are in the class and to me it makes the code easier to read I understand exactly what it's doing that leg one is a member of this class rather than being a static method of another class or something like that. All right, it's about time to create a dog. Make him eat and make him run. Can I tap? Are we ready for me to tab away from uh, this file, or do we need more typing time? I don't hear keyboards. Do I see any hands waving? All right. I'm going to go back to my main class in my lecture.java file. I'm going to comment out the testing for that. I'm sure it worked. Really, you should make you know some code that does these tests, and then you should run all the tests every time you make changes to the program. But I'm commenting it out. All right. Dog Fido is equal to new dog. And then fido.eat, fido.run. It might be fun to go back to the run method and have it check the amount of food. And if his food is equal to zero, then don't let him run, right? Because his food's going to start going negative. But this will do it. Let's see what it does. All right. So I ran it, and here's what our dog did. Opening mouth, mouth is swallowing, closing mouth, this leg is running, this leg is, you know, this is all the stuff that happened when we called Fido.eat, and this is all the stuff that happened when we called Fido.run. I kind of do feel like fluffing out those methods inside the dog class a little bit more, just to make them a little bit more informative. What I'm going to do is just like I said, if food is zero, we're not going to let him run. So, if, parentheses, this dot food equals equals zero, or less than or equal to zero by some horrible chance, then print, no, system.outline, system.out.println, right? System.out.println. No food in belly. I need to eat. And then I'm just going to make a return. This is kind of cheesy programming. You got your exclamation mark. Yeah, I have my exclamation mark in the wrong place because I have more than one return statement in it. I guess I'll take the time to go ahead and implement it as a... No, I'm going to leave it like that. I don't care. All right, but I am going to put the exclamation mark in the right place. One rule, one guideline is to make your code only have one return out of a method. But then there's an alternate school of thought which says that if you're doing error handling, go ahead and put all the error handling up at the top of the method. And feel free to do as many returns there as you want. So that's what this one's doing.
that's probably a valid route. You know, we could keep coming up with things to do to add to it, but I can't think of where I want to take it. But I'm going to uh, go back to my class and make him run twice because I want to see that error message pop up. So fido.eat, fido.run, fido.run. The second time he should refuse to run. Yep, go through and belly. I need to eat. All right. So we kind of created a constellation of classes. We created a group of classes. We have classes within classes. That's fine. You can have classes within classes within classes within classes within classes. And now maybe you see what I mean when I said this is a little bit harder to wrap your brain around in a way than procedural programming, right? Because we have chunks of code in one place, and those chunks of code are being invoked by another thing, and those chunks of code are being invoked by another thing. And at least in this case, they're pretty straightforward, right? You can follow the chain pretty easily. So. I'm pretty happy with our little example here. This is the first time I've done this one, and I'm happy with it. Anybody need typo correction? Any questions? If I give you a UML and tell you what the methods are supposed to do, then you ought to be able to implement it. Like if I was going to give you a, a UML for a Sphere class. Oh, and by the way, if you're going to make something public, you're supposed to put a plus sign. So I should have been putting a plus sign in front of the methods because I made my methods public. If you're going to make something private, you should put a minus sign in front of it. So that method I just made public, those two methods I just made public, and I guess I have one at the very top. The mouth has three methods, I'm going to make them public. I see some heads kind of wobbling, like not really, but let's go on anyway. So. This is the kind of stuff where I recommend you read the book carefully. You read the uh, PowerPoints. All right, so an object is a set of related data which identifies the current state of the object. Our dog had a state variable inside him, which was his hunger. Yeah. We could put other states in him. How tired is he, right? Does he need to sleep? Or what his weight is, and what his breed is, right? What color he is, how old he is, and stuff like that. So an object has methods that interact with the data. The program is not supposed to interact with the data directly, even though the first day that we talked about objects, I showed you that they could. We're not supposed to do that. That's called encapsulation, right? Like a capsule is a pill and it's got a shell around all the medicine. Well, the data is the good stuff and we're going to put a shell around it. And the reason you do that is because you don't trust yourself and especially you don't trust other programmers to use your data right. The programmer should not have any, they don't, they should not have to know how the data is stored. They may not even know that there's a food member of that object. All they know is that they have some methods, one called run and one called, you know, one called eat. And they may not need to know exactly what happens when those are called. What if later on you want to change the uh, food to a double, right? Because it's going to eat 1.5 chickens. Yeah. So then you could change that. And if he's not referring to that piece of data directly, you can make all the changes you want to the data over here, and it's not going to mess him up. So that's called encapsulation. The methods that interact with the data can do validation. Like 
you know, if this is somebody's uh, payroll information and the data is connecting to a database, well, there's probably external security controlling that. But you could also put right here on the method, you know, that when you access the method, it could check, you know, what account you're logged into and then not allow you to access the data, not pull anything out of it. And so even if the, some other user or some dummy programmer started trying to manipulate the data correctly without validating whether they had access to it, then they would not be able to. Or more realistically, maybe not more realistically, more pertinently to this example, if they have access to dot food, I could do this and it would break the program. What if I didn't know what I was doing and I went to my lecture and in my driver, I decided that I wanted to set Fido.food equal to negative 100. Well, that's not going to work real well, right? The code's not going to work very well after that. He's not going to be able to run unless he eats 100 times, right? Maybe I shouldn't be able to do that. Pardon me? So why are you poor Tinderbox? Yeah, the poor dog, right? So what we should do is if we want our main code here, our driver, to be able to change the food variable, we should make a method that changes the food variable called set food. And it might rule out illegal values, right? We may not let the dog's food drop below zero. We may not allow his set function to change it. So we're going to do that. We're going to go back to our dog class. We're going to change food to private. And then when I go back, I'm going to have an error in my code. Because I was trying to set the food to equal to negative 100. Well, I can't access food anymore because it is a private member of the class. So I can't mess it up. Now, that doesn't make it more secure. You know, when we're talking about whether something is private or not, people get the idea that that, that is, a, you know, a security, a cybersecurity point of view. No, it's a programming point of view, you know. If your data is being stored out in a database in plain text or whatever, and people can go in and hack into the, you know, the database and make changes to it, uh, then it didn't matter how many times you declared your data as private. But what it makes for is good programming. It makes it so that the only way you could access the state of the object and to change it is through the behaviors that you specify. So you write it to be safer. Like if you have a graphics drawing you know, program and you want to draw squares and rectangles and circles all over your screen, well, you don't want your main program to have to worry about moving things off the edge of the screen. So you would not want it to be able to directly modify the x and the y position. Instead, you would have a set x and a set y. And if it was being moved off the edge of the screen, it would know that it's not going to draw it or something like that. Anyways, I need to get rid of that. What I need to do, though, is put a set food method so that I can allow ourselves to modify it. Now, whenever you make a private variable, a private member, consider to yourself, do I need a getter and a setter? And those have fancier names than getter or setter. That's a colloquial term. I'm going to go back to the dog, and I'm going to give him a setter. Kind of appropriate. It might be an Irish setter. I'm so funny. Okay, so anyways, public, because we want to be able to call this for main, void set food. Now, this one needs to take a variable so that we could tell it to, you know, that his food was 100 or something like that. So I'm going to say int food. Now this is a case where I absolutely have to use the this keyword. And I'm going to type in something without using the this keyword. And it would not work. Why is that? Because when I type food equals food, I'm trying to change the value of this int. But it's just setting this parameter equal to itself. So instead I need to do this dot food equals food. What that does is it says, okay, we're going to change the value of the member equal to this. And you only have to use the, this keyword because this has the same name down to the case and everything of that. 
So if you did not want to use that keyword, the, this keyword, you could change that variable name and you wouldn't need to. But this is such a common thing to do that I just recommend that you accept it. Right, because if you called it something dumb like int x, then that doesn't make any sense to the, uh, another programmer trying to figure out what your code does. What is x? I mean, it may be, you know, maybe they could figure it out, but all righty. So, but let's do that thing where we forbid negative values of food. So how about that? If food is less than zero, we're going to print an error message. System.out.println. Food cannot be set less than zero. And then let's return. Now, we also could have written it in a, as an else, right? I'm just kind of following the, uh, the model that I mentioned where you can put error handling up at the top of a method. Both of them are valid. Wouldn't be anything wrong with doing else here instead of a return. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go back to my uh, driver, to my main class, and I'm going to call set food negative 100, just to see it print out the error message. So, Fido.setFood, negative 100. I'm a jerk and I should be reported to the ASPCA. All right, and here it says, Food cannot be set less than zero. We saved our poor dog. More importantly, we preserved the state of our data to a valid state. You can't have a negative amount of food in your belly, hopefully. <laughs> so, we have what's known as a setter. It's got a more computer programmeries, computer science-y term. This is what's known as a setter, but it's also known as a mutator. Like you're mutating the value, you're changing it, just like gamma radiation mutates the cells or whatever. You know, it's mutating it. What if for some reason our driver needed the ability to find out the value of the food variable? Like what if this is really some bank account information and we made the bank account, the, the current balance, private? But we did want the program to be able to access it, you know, and to display it on the screen if that user had rights to do so. We would need to provide a getter. So we're going to add a getter. It needs to return data of the same type as it is declared. So since food is declared as an int, it's going to be an int. So public int. This is the first time we've used a, a non-void method. So public int get food. And it doesn't accept any parameters. It doesn't take any arguments because we're just asking for something. We're not telling it to do something. We're asking for the state. And so what's it going to do? It's going to return this dot food. I'm going to go back and modify my UML to reflect the fact that we have more stuff that we've added some stuff. Because if you've worked professionally, you know that what usually happens is that documentation is created and then the program is changed and the documentation is never updated. So, the dog class. Food is now a private member. So I'm going to put minus. Plus means a public member. Member meaning either you know a variable or a method. Minus means a private member. And I added two more methods, right? I added a set food, I added a mutator, and I added a get food, which is I didn't tell you the name of it. It's an accessor. So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to put that as a comment. This is a getter, but that's also known as an accessor. Now, in class, I'm always going to talk about adding getters and setters. And then when you read in the book, it's going to talk about using mutators and accessors. All right. 
So, he has two new methods. They're both public. One was called get food, and it returns an int. The next one was called, where, where's my plus sign? Set food, and it took an int as a parameter, but it didn't return anything. It could return something. It could return an error code, right? So that we would know whether it could return true or false based on whether set food worked or not. But traditionally, your setters don't return anything, and your getters return the same type of the data. All right. And I guess I better document what these methods do. Get food returns the value of the food variable. Set food sets the value of the food variable, displaying an error message if the argument was negative. All right. This is my favorite example I ever did. I'm so happy. Okay. So a class is a description, the blueprint for a set of objects. On the next slide, note the three computers on the conveyor belt. They represent objects. And then there's a class called computer. So we have a specifications. Each computer has different attributes. One of them is gray, one's black, one's white. These look kind of like faces, right? A little mouth and a nose and eyeballs. They don't look terribly happy. That one too. But anyways, and your computer might have, you know, different colors. It might have a different number of gigabytes. It might have a, you know, a CD drive or not, you know, a DVD drive. Nowadays, all the laptops don't come with drives, which annoys me, but they got to have paper-thin laptops. So the class is a description. The description consists of a list of variables and a list of methods. And a class can define two types of variables, instance variables and class variables. The class variables are the static variables. The instance variables are the non-static variables. Now, we didn't use any static variables in this one. And the... You're not going to use static variables very, very, very much. Instance meaning that you have to create an instance of the class. You have to have an object before you can use that method. We can't call dot run until we make a dot, right? You can't have the let the mouth eat until you you've made the mouth. That's what this code does here, right? Is inside our dog class, we created the new mouth and the new legs because without them, since dot run and dot eat are instance methods, we had to have an object in order to use it. So instance variables and instance methods are more common than the static ones, the class variables and the class methods. So we're going to focus on them. We may not even have any static methods and static, you know, variables for a while. So the class's instance variables describe the type of data that the object can store, the state of the object. If you've ever played Sims, right, and you have the, uh, you know, the little people who are running around and they have a boredom indicator and a hunger indicator and an anger indicator and a, you know, a social indicator, that's all the state of that particular sim. So if we have a class for computer objects, the class might contain a hard disk size. It might also have a color and an amount of RAM, that kind of stuff. What operating system is installed on it. And so each computer object stores a value for the size of the computer's hard disk. Each computer could have a different hard disk size. If you made it static, then they would all share that. So, you know, if you ever change the hard disk size, it would magically change the hard disk size for every object. And like I said, static, you're not going to use very often. A class's instance methods specify the behavior that it can exhibit. In other words, the way that you can change the data, manipulate the data. So our computer class might have something called print specifications. 
that would print out the hard disk size and the color of the computer and whether it has an optical drive or not. So the specifications report could show the hard disk size, the CPU speed, the cost, etc. So note the term of the use of the term instance in instance variable and instance method. It reinforces the fact that those are associated with a particular object instance. Every instance could have a different hard disk size. Every object has its own value for that. Now, coincidentally, they might all, all have the same value, right? We could have created 20 dogs, and then they would all start off with zero food. But then when you fed one of the dogs, his food would go up while the other ones stayed the same. So UML stands for Unified Modeling Language. And it's a lot more complicated than what we're just seeing here. But, you know, we got to start off simple. So the name of the class, the variables, also known as attributes. And, ooh, now we even have throwing in a new word, operations. Okay, cool. Got to put as many different terms for the same thing here because lots of computer scientists have to define things their own way. Behaviors slash operations slash methods. Some people call these properties. And then in uh, C sharp, the term property actually means a pair of variables, excuse me, a pair of behaviors that modify a phantom hidden value. So, you know, properties mean different things. Anyways, I'm just going to call them variables and methods from now on, right? I think that's good enough for us. Just be aware that the book might call them attributes and it might call them methods operations. So variables and methods. Notice the uh, syntax, the name of the variable, colon, the type, the weight, colon, double. I guess if it's not going to return anything, they don't put colon void, they just don't put a, anything at all. I could get down with that, but I'm going to put void. All righty, so here they're defining a class that matches the UML. Remember our mouse here has an age and a weight and a percent growth. And I could see us on another day typing in a mouse. Kind of duplicate this. So he's got several private variables, an age, a weight, and a percent growth. Why are they made private? So that they cannot be set to invalid values. Right? You can't set the age to a negative value in the, in the driver for the mouse. We're trying to maintain valid state information. And then there are some methods. You can set the rate of growth for the mouth, mouth, for the mouse. How fast does he grow every day? And then you can call grow, which will make him grow that percent. And then you call, can call display, which would display his state information, his age, his weight, and his percent. So we declare the variables here. And then we declare the methods underneath. Now in this language, you don't have to do that. In C++, you had to declare things in a very specific order. You had to declare all the functions before you could use them. Well, in this one, it doesn't matter whether you list the variables at the top of the file or at the bottom of the file or mixed in. But by convention, it's nice to have all your data defined up at the top of the class and then you list your methods. So percent, percent growth rate, that's a setter, that's a mutator. So it's going to change this dot percent growth rate equal to the argument that was passed in. No difference between the slides? Well, I guess. Uh, all right. And then we have a grow method. What does a grow method do? It increases the weight of the mouse, just like our eat method, raise the food. It increases it by the percent. And then display. Displays the age and the weight of the mouse. So private and public access. Those are known as access modifiers. If you apply the access modifier to a member of the class, you determine how easy it is for the member to be accessed. Okay, now that's fluffy wording, how easy it is. No, it declares where that method can be called, that member can be called from. If it's private, it can only be called from within the class. If it's public, then the driver for that class can access it. 
So if you declare a member to be private, then the member can only be accessed from within that class. So instance variables are almost always declared private because you want the object's data to be hidden. Making the data hard to access is what encapsulation is all about, and it's one of the cornerstones of OOP. Trying to write bulletproof programs that other programmers and, or yourself, if you come back to this code 10 years later, cannot easily goof. You are providing the only ways that that data could be manipulated via the methods. And so if you make your code good, then somebody can come in and use your class, you know, and they're not going to have to know how it works. We don't know how dot next int works and how has next float works and that kind of stuff. We don't know how dot sign and, you know, dot tangent and all those other members of those. You know, we don't know how they work and we shouldn't have to. The data is hidden from us. We have no idea how the, it's good, the communication is going on, you know, between the keyboard and stuff like that. Data hiding is a generally a good thing. So if you declare a member to be public, then the member can be accessed from anywhere, or basically from the driver, from within the member class or outside the member class. So methods are usually declared with the public modifier, because you want to be able to call them from anywhere. So I'm just going to write some guidelines, and we're going to keep adding to this list of guidelines, so I'm going to wind up writing them over and over and over. But right now, our guidelines are going to be data private, methods public, and then add getters and setters. Those are our three guidelines. We'll increase them. We'll come up with more. And I guess you could put, uh, you know, getters and setters as two different things, and then that would be four guidelines. But All right, about the last thing I want to do today, excuse me, my voice is broken, is I want to show you all a cute little feature that NetBeans gives you. So in my dog class, say I decide I want to add a new member variable. And we're not going to do anything with it, but I'm going to call it um, height or age. Yeah. So private int age is equal to zero. And then what's Professor Thompson's rule of thumb? Data private, members public, add getters and setters. Okay, he needs getters and setters. Cheap and easy way to add getters and setters if you're using NetBeans. Highlight the variable, right click, and go to refactor, which you can also find up here. Refactor, encapsulate fields. And then you check what it want, you want it to make. You want it to make a get age and a set age. And then you click refactor. And then boom, if you look, it's created a get age method and a set age method for you. Now I want you to know how to do it on your own. But it sure is nice to be able to create some variables and then boom, have NetBeans do it, right? Because you could list 10 different variables and then you could highlight them all and you could say encapsulate and instantly whammo, you've created the 20 methods that go along with it. So that's nice. And if we look at this get age and this set age, well, it added the Java doc comment right away. That's kind of nice. This one looks just like get food did. It's declared as public. It returns. And this one looks like the set food did. It passes the argument in that has the same name as the member. And so it uses the this keyword to differentiate between the parameter and the member variable. All right. So if I was going to go to legs, and I'm just going to be totally silly here. What does a leg have? It's got the number of toes, and it's got the number of hairs. So I'm just going to highlight those two things. Go ahead and add the getters and the setters for those. And I think when I do that encapsulate, I think it even turns those private. Oh, but before I do that, I want to show you something. You don't have to do this, but inside my dog, when I call run, I'm going to do something with that variable, right? This dot leg one dot 
toes equals five. My dog has five toes. I'm doing that just for a reason, right? So inside the run method, inside dog, I'm changing the toes to five. The reason why I want you to see that is because when I encapsulate these guys, right, I highlight those variables, encapsulate fields, refactor it. Now if I go back to that code that was changing that field directly, it is now using the setter. Fixed it for you. Kind of nice. I want you to know how to do that, but I also want you to know how to write a getter and an accessor by hand, right? We use these things because they're nice, but we also have to know what we're really doing. Anything that helps speed up your coding is a good thing, though. All righty, so what am I going to ask you to do? I'm going to want you to modify the class that you wrote for the last assignment to add the getters, to add the setters, to make the data private. And let's see if there's any other changes we want to make to it. I'm going to go look at the homework assignment. The block class. All right, that's kind of tedious. I mean, uh, kind of a simple example, but all right. That's going to be lame. To add getters and setters, all, what are we going to have to do? You're just going to highlight those three variables and add, you know, X, you know, do accessors. So do them by hand. Even though I just showed you how to use NetBeans to do it, add the getters and the setters by hand. And then, so our rule is going to be, I mean, our assignment, homework, modify the block class so that data is private. It has, the methods are public. They may already be, they may not be. And we have getters and setters. Write them yourself, don't cheat. And then modify your driver to actually ask for input values. So if you're not already asking the user for the width, for the height, width, and depth of the block before displaying the volume. And then lastly, add a get surface area method to the block class. If you can't figure out the formula, ask me. On the other hand, if you go to Google and do surface area for block, they'll probably come up with a great formula for you. Make sense, guys? All righty. Let's make a Dropbox. When we uh, turn in a file with multiple Java files, do we just zip the folder then? Or do we you could it? zip it, or you could just select three Java files, you know, shift-click yeah. or whatever, and upload all three. I'd rather you do that, honestly. Okay. 